In this episode, we're setting up our AI character to be able to jump to navigate around obstacles, but also follow its target when that target is nowhere in the nav mesh. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And as we get deeper and deeper into AI, there's one thing I really need to make clear to you guys. In regards to AI, I really am flying by the seat of my pants here. I have literally set up maybe two AI characters in the past two years learning Unreal Engine, and I am learning as I go along. And so increasingly, as we go into these episodes, I'm gonna be asking you for feedback. Can I do something better than how I've already configured it? And so any critiques that you have or any ways of improving the AI that we're coming up with, here, I very much appreciate your feedback in the comments below. And this episode is building directly on our previous episode, an introduction to AI. So if you haven't checked that out already, I strongly encourage you to do so. With the complexity of AI generally, the way I'm thinking about this is to break the problem down into its constituent elements. And so each episode, we're going to solve one or more problems. And this episode is the start of that. And if you're just entering into this series and you want a good place to start, I would start at episode 45, which is where we set up a metahuman character to be our AI character. And then from 45, you could jump straight into 47, our last episode. And at the end of that last episode, we had a functional AI character running around, but that's about all it did. It ran around like a headless chicken and about every five seconds, it got stuck. So with this episode, we're beginning to make our AI just a little bit smarter. So he's going to be able to navigate rocky terrain around simple obstacles, and then also follow targets that are moving in midair. And I've noticed some issues with the AI perception component, specifically maintaining line of sight, especially when their target isn't moving at all. So we're going to solve that this episode. And at the tail end of this, the last five minutes or so, we're just going to solve a number of issues that are related to the rest of this series, but are tied into our AI character. So if you're not following the series, you don't need to do that. There are no new concepts this episode, we're just building on everything we learned last episode and really throughout this series, just building on our AI controller, but also behavior trees, decorators, all that stuff. So let's get to it. So we're going to start today by fixing the issue where the AI can't jump, because realistically the AI should be able to jump over simple obstacles like the rocks that I have in my scene here. And to fix this, I have a really unsophisticated solution. So if you have a better way of doing this, by all means, please post in the comments below. And so we're going to start today by going into our content drawer and then opening up our AI character and mine's under my core folder, AI. So BP adversary AI character. So my really unsophisticated way of handling this is that our AI character is every 0.3 seconds going to do a quick line trace in front of it, basically a little bit lower than waist level. And then if it hits something, then it's gonna jump. And initially I thought about doing two different line traces, one a little bit below waist level, but then one around chest level, like basically the maximum height level. But it turned out that I didn't need to do that because if there's an obstacle that's at least, let's say jump height, then the nav mesh is going to solve that issue. Basically the AI is just gonna go around that obstacle. Really for solving the jump issue, we're looking at the difference between the height of the nav mesh and whatever objects are in the AI's path. So if the nav mesh is this high and the object is this high, but then our AI can only step up this high, they're just gonna run right into the object. And that's where jumping is useful. So we're going to create a brand new function called jump and movement check. So over here on the left, I'm just gonna hit plus sign and it's gonna be jump and movement check, all one word. And then now that we have this function, I'm gonna go back to my event graph. And instead of on event tick, we don't wanna do this on event tick. We wanna do it at the end of the event begin play string. Come down here. And then what I'm gonna do is set timer by function name. And I'm just gonna get the exact name that we just created, paste that in here. And the time's gonna be 0.3 seconds and looping. And where I came up with 0.3 seconds is I don't want this to occur so often that it's gonna have a real performance impact, but I want it to occur often enough that if our character is changing direction at any given time, they're still gonna do this check pretty frequently. And we might end up adjusting this along the way, but I think 0.3 seconds, like three times a second, it's a good measure. And make sure to set this to loop because we want it to always occur. So now let's go back into our jump and movement check function. And this is going to end up doing quite a lot. So what I'm gonna do just to organize this a little bit is we're gonna do a sequence node. You've probably seen this before in the animation blueprint, but basically the sequence node allows us to execute things from top to bottom instead of just left to right. It still goes left to right within each node, but it can have a series of things that it does. So you heard me say we're going to do a line trace. And the first thing we need to figure out is how long should that line trace be? And really it comes down to however fast our character is moving, because if it's moving pretty quickly, then we need our line trace to go out further into the distance. And so for that, I'm gonna come down here on the left-hand side, get a reference to our character movement component. And then from character movement, we can get our velocity. 
scroll down a little bit, get velocity. And with the velocity, I don't really care how fast the character is moving vertically, just the x, y, which is horizontally. So I can get the vector length x, y. And then with this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide it by four, because at a minimum, we're going to have some distance. I'm going to set that to be 200 that the line trace goes. But then this part of it, this is going to increase as our character's velocity increases. So from this, I'm going to add 200. But now we have to determine where the line trace is going to start. So I'm going to start at just below waist level. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to get a reference to our capsule component. And then from that, what we can do is we can get the world transform, get world transform here. And we're going to transform the locations, so transform location. This is going to be the start point of the line trace. And it's going to be at X 10, just a little bit in front of the player. And then Z is going to be negative 30. And that's slightly below our player's waist. And I came up with this height just through some trial and error. But basically what I'm going off of under the character movement component here, if we search for step, we get our max step height here, 45 centimeters, 45 units. And that's basically how high our character can step up without jumping. Now, if you think of the capsule component, so it's basically at waist level is zero. And at waist level, it's about 90 centimeters up. So 30 units below that is still about 60 centimeters up. So it's high enough that the character is not going to be able to step up on it. And you'll see what this looks like because we're going to turn on the trace debug. And then from this, that's where we're going to do a line trace by channel, line trace by channel. And that's our starting point. Now I'm going to hook up the zero from the sequence directly to that. I'll put in a reroute node just to make some space here. And then we got to hook up our endpoint for the line trace. And so for that, we're going to use all this down here. So what we're going to do is once again, transform location. And for this transform location node, I can hook this up here. And this is going to be hooked up directly to the X because the X is our character's forward vector. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to right click, split the struct pin and connect this up here. Z is also going to be negative 30. And I can move this entire string up a little bit. And then I'm going to come over here to the right a little bit because we've got to figure out what this is going to do when it hits something. So I'm going to select return value, drag off and do a branch. And then from the true pin, what do we want to have happen? So if it gets a hit at that just below waist level, what do we want to have happen? Well, we're going to tell our character to jump and jump is a standard function that exists on any character. Now we are almost ready to test this. So let's just select for our draw debug type here for duration so we can actually see these line traces in action. And let's compile and save. So as long as we've got this function hooked up in the event graph on begin play to begin looping, it should work. One thing that I ran into when I upgraded to 5.1 is initially my AI was just pathing along the paths and it didn't actually jump over the rocks. So if you see that happening to you, like the AI is taking very circuitous routes to get to its target is a very simple fix for it. So we have to go under our world outliner here and search for recast to this recast nav mesh here. And specifically, you have to find two settings in the recast nav mesh. We have the agent max slope that you can keep exactly the same, but the max step height. So I upped this to like 150. And when I did that, that took into consideration the fact that the AI could actually jump over very high targets. So, so far, so good. We see our AI character. He's able to jump just fine, but there are other problems here. So he just loses sight of our player character when really he should be obviously in sight. So let's solve that problem next. So for this issue, we got to go into our AI controller. So back to our content drawer, open up our adversary AI controller that we started last episode. And this is an issue with the AI perception component and specifically sight perception. And I've had this issue ever since I started experimenting with AI sight perception. If the player character is not specifically moving or doing something or really whatever their target is, if it's not doing something, then the AI perception component tends to lose sight of it. It just drops away, even when clearly it should still be within line of sight. And so with this as well, I have kind of an unorthodox way of addressing it. So if you have a better solution, I'm all ears. So let's go back to our BP adversary AI character and back into the jump and movement check function. And for this loses sight problem, we're going to address that under our second pin here, the then one. So what we're going to do here is so long as our AI has a current target, every 0.3 seconds, every time this function's called, it's going to do a line trace from our character's head directly to the target. And it's going to check in that line trace, does it actually hit our target? And so long as it hits our target, it's going to refresh our line of sight perception. But if that line trace hits something else and there's something in the way, then obviously it's lost line of sight, then it's not going to refresh. So we're going to start by getting a reference to our AI controller. So we get that. And then from that, we got to get a reference to our blackboard because we specifically need to look at the value that we set up last episode for our blackboard, which is our current target. So we need to get value as object from our blackboard. And from the key name, I'll drag this out and I'll make literal name. And this literal name is what we set up last episode. So this is the current underscore target. 
And yours might be called something different if you're not following this series. But where I'm getting this from, let me just show you that. So go back into your behavior tree, and then on our Blackboard, you need to get this key here, whatever your current target object is called. So back in our BP adversary AI character. From this, what we're going to do is we're going to cast to actor. And if the cast fails, that just means we don't have a current target. And so I'll drag this down a little bit, connect this up, this also I'm going to drag down. And then from this, I'm actually going to right click and promote it to a variable, not a local variable, but a real variable. So that's going to be instead of as actor, our current target, no spaces. And so then following this, that's when we're going to do another line trace by channel, line trace by channel. And for the start of it, I can get something similar to what we did up here. So I can copy both of these and then paste them down there. And I'm going to move this out a little bit because our end is going to be a little bit more complicated. And the starting location is going to be at Z equals 80. Because if you think at Z0 is the waist, it's about 90 centimeters above the waist, which is eye level. And I can connect this up to the start. Now for our end location, it is going to be our target's location, but the thing is that we always want to make sure it goes through our target. So it has to be further than our current target's location, because if it just ends at our current target's location, it might not actually hit the target. This is just something I ran into with the flamethrower episode back in episode 27. So the way we're going to address that is we're going to get our current target that we just set, and then we're going to get the actor location. And instead of just hooking this directly up to here, what we're going to do is we're going to subtract this location from our original location where our eyes are. And we're going to add that difference. So we're going to add the length of the trace to our actor's location. So basically, it's going to double the length of the trace and then connect this up here. And one other thing I found to make this work properly, make the trace channel instead of visibility camera. And that way it actually hits the character's mesh. Again, I'm going to do a draw debug type of for duration. And I'll come over here to the right. We'll do another branch node here. So if we do get a hit, if this is true, then what we got to do is we got to compare what we hit, like the actor that actually gets hit to our current target. We need to check to see, are those the same? Because for example, if it hits a wall, it's not going to be our current target. So then we don't have line of sight. So from our out hit, we can break our hit result. And specifically, we need to get our hit actor here. And we can compare this to by doing equals equals. And then we can compare this to our current target. So I can drag and reference, get current target, hook this up, collapse this and move this right over here. Actually, I'll just move these up a little bit. So if these two things are the same, then we do have line of sight. So the question is, what do we want to have happen if these two things are the same? And so here's where I'm doing something kind of janky. And this is just my method of refreshing the target. And I found this to work great. But again, I'm open to other possibilities. So let's compile and save this. And we'll go back to our adversary AI controller that we started last episode. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to collapse everything past this branch on target perception updated. I'm going to collapse all of this to a function. And the reason I'm going to collapse all of it to a function is we're going to call this function from our adversary AI character. And that's what's actually going to refresh our perception. So I'm going to right click after selecting all these collapse to function and then move it into position. And I'll move this reroute out just like this. So our function, I'm going to right click over here, rename, it's going to be has line of sight. So next, we're going to reorganize this function a little bit. So instead of passing in our actor here, what I'm going to do is disconnect this pin. And then we're going to promote actor to a variable. So right click promote to variable, connect this up, connect this up here. And I'm going to rename this to be our current target. And then if I go into the has line of sight function, so what I'm going to do is get rid of the input pin here, get rid of this, get rid of this, and we're always going to use this current target here. And the reason we're doing this is because we are going to set a timer for next tick from our adversary AI character that's then going to reference this adversary AI controller function. And if we set a timer for next tick, then we can't use input variables. And so that's why I'm setting it this way. So let's compile and save this. We'll go back to our adversary AI character. And now we're going to create a new function that actually calls that function. It's basically going to reset our current target and then call that function that we just set up. So I'll hit a plus sign for new function. This is going to be called continues line of sight. And this function is going to have a single input variable. So plus sign here, and this is going to be our current target. And this is going to be an actor of type actor object reference. And so in this function, we got to start by getting a reference to our AI controller. And then from that, we are going to set our current target. So not the top one, this one right here. And I know this is a little confusing because now we have variables on both our adversary AI character and our controller called current target. So make sure not to confuse them. And what this is doing is it's basically clearing that reference from our AI controller. And then once it clears it, then it's going to set it again. And what I found that to do is it basically resets the target. So it reestablishes the line of sight. So set current target, this one, 
and connect this up here, put in a reroute. And last but not least, I'll come over here and from this pin, we are going to set timer for next tick by function name and then connect this up here. One more reroute. And that function name is going to be exactly what we just created on our AI controller, which is the has line of sight function. So I'll get the exact name verbatim, come back, paste it in. And there's one more thing I missed here. So our current target from here that we pass in has to be connected up when we reset the current target. So I'm just going to put one reroute, second reroute. So if you got all this, compile and save. And we'll go back to the jump and movement check function. And then if this is true, so if our current target matches our hit actor here, that's when we're going to call the continues line of sight function. And we've got to hook up our hit actor from this hit result. We have to hook that up to our current target here. So let's compile and save and we're ready to test this. So what should happen here is that as long as we don't jump, as long as we're not floating above the ground, our AI character should not lose line of sight. And yep, it looks like he is sticking with our character just fine. So he can jump. And the reason I'm not jumping is because I don't want to leave the nav mesh. And that leads us to our next issue. So if I hit four for our air and speed boost. Yeah, so then our AI character, he doesn't know how to follow our target. And we also get our first issue when we leave play mode. This took damage sound effect, access none. We set this up back in episode 42, the health and damage episode. And we'll resolve this at the end of the episode. So if you get this or any other issues, just hang tight, we'll get to those. So the way we're going to solve the issue with the AI character being unable to follow the player when in air is every single 0.3 seconds with our jump and movement check, it's going to check to see, okay, is our player in air or is our target in air? And then do a line trace down to the ground and get that location that's within the nav mesh. And then that location is what's going to update our AI when it can't actually reach the target. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to zoom out here and we're going to do another sequence pin right here. And then from this sequence pin, the first thing we need to do is we need to get our current target and we need to check, okay, is that a character that's currently in the air? So what I can do is I can select all of these, paste them down below, and then instead of casting to actor, what we're going to do is cast to third person character. So BP third person character, not this one, this one. And then I can connect up our sequence here. Now, if the cast fails here, that just means that our current target, it's not a third person character. So that's fine. And if you remember our BP adversary AI character that we set up back in the metahuman episode, I think that was episode 45, it's a child class of our BP third person character. And the reason we're casting to this is that these are the only characters, really the only entities that are going to be in the air, at least for now. So as BP third person character, we need to get a reference to our animation blueprint. So anim BP, get anim BP reference, because our animation blueprint stores whether or not our character is falling. So get is falling. And then if is falling is true, then we can branch, connect this up. And that's when we need to do a line trace down from our current target. So we've already gotten our current target here. So from this, I can get our actor transform, come down a little bit. And what we're going to do from here is the same kind of thing we did above. So transform location, and that's going to be our starting point of the line trace. And then we have a second one for our ending point of the line trace. And so if true, then we're going to do a line trace by channel, connect this up to the start connect this one up to the end, move this in. And the question is how far down do we need to do a line trace? So I'm going to estimate how high I think our character will ever be off the ground. And I'm going to guess no more than 2000. So that's about 20 meters. So I'm going to set this to negative 2000. And once again, just for troubleshooting, I'm going to set the draw debug to four duration and we can select our return value branch off of that. And then from our out hit, we can break the hit result. We've got to get our location of the hit. So location here. And what we're going to set based on this location is on our behavior tree, our current movement goal location without a target. Now we actually do have a target. It's just an error, but we're going to set this regardless. So back in our adversary AI character, I'm just going to come over here to the left, come over here to the left. I'm going to get the same content right here. These three paste it over here on the right hand side. Because what we have to do, if I go back to my blackboard, then I can right click, I can rename, get that exact name of our vector, go back to our adversary AI character, paste that in here. And from our blackboard here, we're going to set value as vector. Only if we get a hit, do we do this? This gets connected up to the key name. And then from our location, that's what gets connected to the vector value. And then I'm going to collapse this here, move it down just a little bit, move these in.
And I thought about actually doing this setup on the behavior tree itself, like a simple parallel where it was continuously getting our target location. But I realized that that's kind of performance intensive because then it's getting that new location every single tick. And then this way, we only have to do it every 0.3 seconds. So this is going to update our current movement goal location without a target. But how do we ensure that our AI character actually moves towards this target instead of still having the actual target, our character that's floating up in air and not knowing how to get to that target that's up in the air. So what we're going to do to address that is back in our behavior tree, if I go to the behavior tree here, we're going to set up a couple of decorators that determine whether or not our character is currently in air. And then if the character is in air, then it's going to use instead of the current target, it's going to use our current movement goal location without a target. But we're going to restructure this behavior tree just a bit. We're actually going to simplify it. So let's start by creating two new decorators. So I'm going to come up here, say new decorator. And actually, I'm going to create a new folder in our AI folder. And this folder is going to be BT decorators. And I'll go into that folder. And then down here, I'm just just going to name it BT decorator underscore target not in air. So if you remember from last episode, so decorators like this has line of sight to target, they basically check to see whether a given node is true. And then only if that node is true, does it go ahead and do the things below it. And so I'm going to go back to my BT decorator here, and we have to override a function. And the function we're going to override is this perform condition check AI. And that's the check to see whether or not our target is currently in the air. So within this check, first I'm going to right click, I'm going to promote this to a local variable, our owner controller, I'll connect it up here, and I'll rename that variable. So rename, it's going to be our local controller reference, I'm going to move out a return node, and I'm going to come back over to our adversary AI character. And I'm just going to copy this right here, current target, copy that back to our decorator, I can paste that in because from our local controller reference, what I'm going to do is get a reference to our blackboard. So this one down here, and then from this, what I'm going to do is get value as object. So as object here, connect this up our current target, and I'm going to move both of these over just a little bit. So from this, we're going to do an is valid check. So do we currently have a target? And only if we currently have a target, does it proceed? So if it is valid, we currently do have a target, then I'm going to cast to BP third person character, this one, connect that up. Now what we're going to do for the second half of this is we're going to use a new local variable that's pass check and question mark because it's going to be a boolean and that local variable is then going to be what gets passed into the return node and that basically determines whether or not the decorator is true and whether or not the node can then go ahead and the way we're going to set this whether or not it's true is from our BP third person character same kind of thing we already did so we got a reference to our animation blueprint get Adam BP reference. And then from that, we check to see, okay, is our character falling? Get is falling. And this decorator is not an error. So we want this not to be true. So we'll do a not, not this one. If we come up, not Boolean there. And then that's gonna be connected up to set pass check. So we'll set that variable, this one that we just set up, connect this up. And then that's gonna be connected up to our return node here. Now, if the cast fails here, that means our target is not a third person character. And in that case, what I want to do is I just want to set this to true. I want this to be passed because if our target is not a character. That means it's not an error. So all's good. So I'm going to put in a reroute here just so I can connect this up just like this. But if our target is not valid, what I'm going to do is duplicate this one more time. And this is going to be false because if we don't have a target, then I don't want it to pass the check. Basically, if we don't have a target, that means I want it to stay in patrol mode or be looking for the target, whatever it's already doing. So if you've got all that, if that looks good, then let's compile and save. And let's go back to our content drawer into that BT decorators folder. And now we're going to duplicate this because we're going to have a BT decorator target is in air or just target in air. And we'll double click to go into that. And we can go into the perform condition check AI. And we just need to update these conditions slightly. So in this case, if the target is an error, then is falling is going to be true. So I'll connect this up here. And then these two, I'm going to set these both to false. So pass check to false and this one pass check to false, because if we don't have a target, then it's not going to be in the air. And if it's not a third person character, it's not going to be in the air only if it's a third person character and it's fallen. So we'll compile and save this. And the last step is we got to hook up these decorators in our behavior tree and basically prune our tree a little bit. So let's go into our behavior tree. So the first thing is I'm going to get rid of the two waiting nodes. And I know they're pretty standard, but in our case, in the game prototype we're making, AI is not going to be waiting around. It's going to be always doing something. So we'll delete out these. 
And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to lower our patrol stuff a little bit. So this is going to proceed from top to bottom, left to right. So I want everything to kind of flow in that direction. I'm also going to delete out this rotate to face blackboard entry here because the rotation is going to happen automatically based on our character's animation. And we got our move to current target here. That's always going to be the priority. But then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to duplicate this node right here. Move to current movement goal location without a target. We're going to put that a little bit to the right, a little bit below of move to because this one is going to be taken if our current target is not in the air, but this one's going to be taken if it is in the air. And both of these require has line of sight to target to be true. So we're going to select our first one here and then we can right click, we can add a decorator and we can select our target not in air for this one. Now we'll come down to the second one, right click, same thing, add decorator target is in air. And so this one's moving to our vector and this one's moving to our actual current target because it's reachable in the nav mesh. And what I'm going to do is just kind of consolidate, clean these up a little bit. So if you can see everything on one screen, that looks good. The one last thing I have to change here is this is no longer going to be a sequence, right? It's not going to do one and then two. It's going to select. It's going to choose between these two. So instead of chase target being a sequence here, we have to change this over to be a composite selector node. And then I can copy our has line of sight decorator and paste that into the selector here. And I can delete out this one. And then I'll connect this one up to these two. And this one I can rename to be Chase's Target. Now the very last thing we have here is we have to choose for each of our decorators whether or not they're going to abort everything or just lower priority stuff that's to the right in the behavior tree. So this one, if our target changes, if the target not in air changes, then it's going to abort everything because that's our highest priority. It's going to move to our current target. But this one is not going to abort everything. It's just going to abort whatever's lower priority. So all of this stuff. So this abort lower priority. The very last thing, which is really easy to forget here, is for both of these nodes, for both of these move to nodes here, make sure that the observed blackboard value is checked for both of these. So this one right here, check that off. And what that's going to do is it's going to make sure to update our current move to target based on this changing. Because the problem is, as our character or as the target is moving through the air, if this isn't updating, then it's always going to run to whatever value was first set here. It's not going to update its move to location in real time. So if that's looking good, if you've got all that, then save this and we are ready to test. So the way you want to test this is you want to be floating, flying in air. If you're not following the series, just jump around a lot and make sure your AI character stays with you. And you can also test to make sure that when you do go in line of sight, then a character eventually loses sight of you. So if I come back here, let's see if he still follows. And the line of sight timer is set to about four seconds. So if he can establish line of sight within four seconds, he'll reacquire the target. Now, of course, what remains here is the fact that when he does lose line of sight, he doesn't really intelligently look for me, right? So we're going to work on that next episode. But the remainder of this episode, what we're going to do is just fix a few errors that I've noticed in testing this. Now, the rest of this episode is really focused on issue fixes regarding this series. So if you're not following the series, feel free to skip right over this. But I just want to fix three different issues that I saw over the course of testing this. So the first one we already saw in this episode. And for that, I'm going to go into our third person character blueprint back to core third person character. And it's in this took damage sound effect function. And I think that's under our received damage. Yeah, took damage sound effect here. And what's happening here is whenever our AI character takes damage, it spawns the sound attached. But the problem is if our player character is too far away, then the sounds attenuated. And so the sound actually never gets created. Basically, the sound only gets spawned if it's actually going to be heard by our player. It's the classic problem of if a tree falls in the forest and no one actually heard it, did it make a sound? And in this case, the answer is no. The subjective, the hearer, is is a necessary prerequisite for the actual objective sound. So what I'm going to do is make some space between these nodes. And I'm just going to do the classic is valid check. This one right here. And only if it's valid. So only if that sound actually gets spawned, go ahead and play. Duplicate that two more times and hook it up. Make sure to hook up the return values to the is valid check. And by the way, what we're probably going to end up doing in the future is overriding this function anyway on our AI character, because obviously we don't want all the AI characters having the same exact grunt sounds. We want to give them each a set of specific sounds, and we'll do that in the future at some point. And we'll probably do that via a blueprint function library and some data tables. But this will suffice for the time being, just so that we're not throwing errors all over the place. So compile and save this. And speaking of errors, there's another error that I saw from time to time. And this is when our AI character goes into a fall. So to fix this, we got to go into our animation blueprint and specifically go back to the event graph. 
and I'm going to zoom out a little bit because what we need to address is right down here. So all of our hard landing roll, hard landing straight down, hard landing recovery. And what I've noticed from time to time, and I don't know why this is, but for whatever reason, the AI can sometimes get into this infinite loop or the footsteps just constantly. Duh, 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 duh. And this is related to episode 41 with our falling sound effects. So if this is happening to you, if you're noticing that, then what we're going to do is on this Anim Notify reset capsule here. And if you're unsure what this is, it's episode 41, our falling animations. But when that that atom notify gets triggered what we're going to do is we're going to clear timer by function name and the timer we're going to clear is sliding footstep sound and just make sure that that matches verbatim this function here that we set up in episode 41 so compile and save that and so the last issue fix is also related to episode 41 and back in that episode we set it so that when our third person character goes into a hard landing whether it's straight down or in a roll that their controller input is disabled so they can't actually do anything they can't move they can't cast spells etc and the problem is this disable input, it does not work for AI characters. It's specifically for player controllers, not AI controllers. So to disable and enable AI controller input, it's a little bit more arduous. So we have to create a new function on the left-hand side here. And I'm gonna call this AI disable controller input. And I'm gonna do this on our third person character animation blueprint. So that way any AI character using this can then behave appropriately. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna start with our third person character reference. And then from that, we are going to get the controller. And from the get controller, then we can cast to our adversary AI controller, cast to adversary AI controller. Because if it's just a regular player controller, then this is gonna do nothing and it's totally fine. And then from our adversary AI controller, we can set ignore move input. And we have to do a couple of other things. So I'm gonna drag out a pin here. I'm gonna get the path following component. And this is the component that actually follows paths. And we have to set that to not be active. So set active, I'm gonna set it to not be active. And last but not least, we have to get our actions component. Get actions comp. And we're gonna do the same thing for our actions component. Set active and set it to not be active. So I'll connect this up and put in a little reroute. So if that's looking good, then what we have to do is duplicate this function. So right click and duplicate. And this is gonna be our AI enable controller input. And actually I reversed something. So the AI disable controller input, go back to that function, make sure this is checked. So set ignore move input is checked. And then the one on enable controller input, this is unchecked. And then for these two, it's gonna be checked and checked because both of these are then gonna be reactivated. Once we've got these, compile and save, we'll go back to our event graph. And I'm just gonna make some space in between the disable input and enable input here, and then everything else that's happening after that. So make some space there. And in addition to disabling our third person character player controller input, we are also going to disable our AI controller input. So regardless of whether the AI controller or a player controller is used, it's gonna do the same thing. Connect these up, connect this up here. And then this one down here is gonna be our enable controller input connect it up, connect it up here. So let's compile and save this. And to test this out, I just did a very simple thing on our third person character. So if I go back to the event graph on our third person character, come down to the bottom, this is just gonna be temporary. So I'm gonna do a keyboard button and let's do keyboard button T for test. And from pressed, we'll do a flip flop so we could turn it on and off. And to test this, we're just gonna get actor of class. So get actor of class and the class is gonna be adversary AI character. And then from the return value, we can get our anim BP reference, anim BP reference, and then we can call that function AI disable controller input and connect it up here. And then the reason we did a flip flop is I can copy all of this. And then instead of AI disable controller input, we'll just do AI enable and then connect this up just like this. So what this should do is when I press T, it should completely immobilize our AI character because we only have one in the world. And then when I press T again, it'll be right back to normal. So let's test this out. All right, our AI is moving towards us, getting closer, and then T, he is frozen in place. And then I press T again, he is back to moving towards us. So for the last part of this episode, let's just clean up our functions. And the first thing I'm gonna do, back to our content drawer, let's open up our third person character. Let's delete out this, delete out that compile and save. And then let's go back to our adversary AI character and let's go to the jump and movement check function because instead of having three gigantic strands here, let's collapse each of these to an individual function. So for this top one, I can just select all of these, right click and say collapse to function. And I can get rid of the reroute now because we can hook it up directly to the sequence. And this one, I can right click over here, rename, it's gonna be our jump check. Then I'll do the same thing for our second strand, right click collapse to function. 
and move this into position. And this one's going to be titled, if I right click rename, target line of sight check. And last but not least, we'll select all these, collapse to function. And this one's going to be, if I move it into position, right click rename, target in air check and because we're starting to get a bunch of functions on our ai character i'm going to categorize all of these under ai movement a new category so just select each one not the enable master pose that's the one we did back in episode 45 our meta human character but everything else ai movement so if you got all that if they are collapsed all set compile and save so that concludes our episode for today and in our next episode we're turning our hide and go seek game up a notch so I hope to see you there.